and uh, see what you do. My name is Richard Martin, and I'm the author of the new book, Superfuel, about the future of thorium power. So I'm the author of Superfuel, the new book on thorium power, which just came out May 8th. And it really tells the full story of thorium from its discovery through the work done in the 1960s and 70s up to the thorium revival today. Recap why it's interesting you all that. Well, I've been covering energy for close to 20 years and became interested in the future of nuclear power because I really see it as the only way out, the only carbon-free source of scalable power that's going to get us through the next 50 years. And I actually heard about thorium power in a blog written by Charles Barton Jr., who is the son of one of the nuclear chemists who worked under Alvin Weinberg at National Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 1960s. Go off on whatever you think is interesting. Like, do you want me to guide the interview, or do you have a bunch of set pieces? I'm happy to just talk for a while, and then yeah. you can follow yeah. up. So the importance of thorium is that it's far cleaner, safer, and more abundant than uranium. Conventional nuclear power is essentially stagnated, particularly in the United States. And while I see nuclear power as the only real viable option to provide a low-cost, carbon-free source of energy over the next 30 to 50 years, conventional nuclear power is not going to do the trick. We need not only a new fuel, but a new machine in the form of liquid fuel thorium reactors. Not only do they essentially take care of the problem of nuclear waste from the reactor itself, but they can consume waste from existing conventional reactors and process it down into a state where it can be easily stored and handled. Also, thorium is also anti-proliferation. There's a lot of controversy about this, but basically the fact is it's virtually impossible to extract the form of thorium that's used as a nuclear fuel, which is actually an isotope of uranium. It's impossible to extract it from the reactor and make bombs out of it. It's way too hot to handle. Any rogue state or terrorist operation wishing to build a bomb would be better off just getting raw uranium on the world market and trying to, to enrich it. Um, the economics of thorium are far better as well because thorium is ideally suited to be built in small modular reactors. You can build reactors of 60 megawatts or 100 megawatts or 250 megawatts and array them and assemble them into larger nuclear plants. That gives you a lot more flexibility. Financing is much easier and in theory license should, licensing should be easier as well. Um, could you tell me how you came about uh, your work as a Wired reporter and stuff like that? Your more personal story. Yeah. So I had been covering energy uh, off and on for about 20 years and became very interested in the future of energy for all the obvious reasons that we're facing a climate change crisis and we've got to find a, a way out with low-cost, scalable, carbon-free sources of energy. Really, when you consider all those factors, you're left with nuclear power, but it became clear to me that the conventional nuclear power industry is not capable of the innovation and transformation that will be needed to really solve these problems over the next 10 to 20 years. So when I heard about thorium, I started looking into it. It became clear to me that as a writer, there were a few great things about this story. For one thing, there's, there's a committed group of outsiders who are really trying to change the existing energy paradigm. The other thing is there's a great backstory, right? Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory back in the 60s and 70s, is kind of a forgotten figure in American science, but he was really a pioneer and a prophet of nuclear safety, and he believed in the potential for nuclear power to really be the primary energy source for the world, but he knew that the limitations of uranium-based nuclear power would hold it back, and that's why he started working on developing, researching thorium-based reactors, and in particular, liquid fuel thorium reactors, and Weinberg became convinced that the second nuclear era, as he called it, would really be led by these liquid fuel thorium reactors. And that's what we're seeing today. Weinberg's work is being carried on not only here in the United States, but in places like China, in places like India, in places like the Czech Republic. And I really do believe that we're going to see the second nuclear era that Weinberg predicted. Unfortunately, he, he didn't live long enough to see it, but we're seeing it take shape in various places around the world. 
like you weren't just writing this independently, you were talking to other people. Like what was the process where you vetted it, where it was like maybe something that sounds too good to be true to something that is um, kind of fact checked and, oh yeah, this is real? Well, so when I wrote the Wired article in 2009, that story went through a very thorough fact checking process with the magazine itself. It's a reality of the book publishing industry today that books are not nearly as well fact checked as magazines and in fact I had to do that all on my own. Luckily I had the support of the real heart of the Thorium movement including people like Kirk Sorensen and Ralph Moyer and David LeBlanc and these are the scientists and technologists who are really carrying the work of Alvin Weinberg forward and they are the leading experts in the world on thorium power, on liquid fuel reactors and on really on the advanced nuclear power that we're going to see in 20 years. And so they were kind enough to actually read large parts of the manuscript for me and, and really check some of the facts. And, and as we say in the writing business, the mistakes are all mine, but everything in the book that is, is insightful and, and correct is the result of my collaboration with people like Kirk and David and Ralph and others in the thorium movement. Questions I see are, well, could I hear both sides of the story? There's sort of a assumption from people that um, when you, you talk about something that sounds terribly promising, it's like, well, well, what's the other side of the story? Do you ever hear questions like that? So the question I always get when I give people the brief version of why thorium power is so promising is, well, if it's so great, why aren't we using it now? And the existing nuclear power establishment sort of flips that around and says, well, if thorium was so great, we'd already be using it. That's just not true. Thorium was sidelined due to a range of factors, including economic factors, including political factors, including some of the personalities involved. And it's really a case of technological lock-in, where one technology crowds other possibly superior systems out of the market, not because it's superior or more elegant or more cost-effective, but simply because of market forces and political por forces and personal forces. That's what happened with Microsoft Windows. The reason Microsoft controls 90% of the PC market today is not because it's the best possible operating system for a personal computer. It's because Bill Gates was a brilliant, ruthless businessman who managed to crowd out his competitors. Basically the same thing happened with uranium versus thorium. Uranium was used in the Manhattan Project. They knew how to build bombs with it. They knew that they could run it, for instance, in the naval submarine program, and it was a technology that worked. And so the early nuclear power industry got based around it. And the nuclear power establishment has never been good at sort of seeing other possible development pathways or turning and transforming itself due to new technology or new advances. And so that's why really today the nuclear reactor technology we're using is based on technology from the 1970s. Now we have this alternative path, and I think the pressure from both within and without is starting to have its effect, and it's starting to transform the nuclear power industry. What do you think it says about uh, humanity, or maybe America, that, um, I mean, you guys put a man on the moon, and we, it doesn't look like we're heading for big targets anymore. So, we, as a society, we were once capable of huge, bold, visionary leaps like the Manhattan Project or creating the internet or uh, putting a man on the moon. Several things have changed to make that more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult today. One, the most obvious, is the political system. Um, Congress is paralyzed. Whoever's in the White House after next November will have a very hard time creating an energy policy, much less basing that energy policy around a new and innovative technology that many people are not familiar with. The other thing is our financial system. The financial system has evolved in such a way that it's focused on short-term returns, it's focused mostly on consumer-based technologies, it's focused on quick exit strategies and the like, and it's very hard to get funding and financing for programs or businesses or technologies that are going to take perhaps decades to really pay off, but will create whole new industries around them. What kind of, um, Wired's, Wired's one of those optimistic magazines, right? Like, uh, how do you see the future? Like, what's, what's your positive view of the future should this be deployed effectively? 
Well, in my book, Superfuel, I lay out a program for building several hundred, about 600 uh, new nuclear plants between now and 2050. And that's a hugely ambitious goal, but it can be done. The comparison I make is that Boeing builds a $200 million jet and produces one a day. And modern airliners are far more complex than liquid fuel thorium reactors. So this can be done. It's going to require some government funding. It's going to require private investment to get involved, particularly from Silicon Valley. But if we manage to create a prototype in the next, say, five years, we can start commercializing this technology by 2020. And then between 2020 and 2050, we can build on the order of 20 new nuclear plants a year and create about 500 gigawatts of electricity generation capacity by 2050. That's about half of the current U.S. capacity. And that's a hugely ambitious goal, but we can definitely do it. And we can do it for something on the order of $700 billion. $700 billion is a lot of money, but compare it to the Department of, the, of Defense's annual budget, which is around $685 billion. In other words, for about what we spend in one year on national defense, we can create a sustainable energy infrastructure that will last us a thousand years. Like, do you do you think that Jim Kennedy is taking the right approach in terms of uh, trying to create the cooperative, or do you think what, what's your take on the biggest challenges for the various ways of trying to get this done? Because it's like Kirk Sorensen's got a radically different approach from Jim Kennedy. Well, if you're going to depend on Congress to transform our energy system and come up with a bipartisan approach to an energy policy that delivers sustainable, low-carbon energy for the next generation and the generation after that, you're going to grow old waiting on it. So I think this is going to have to come from the private sector. It's going to require federal support in one form or another, but we're not going to get a new Manhattan Project for energy. It's just not going to happen. So right now, the Obama administration is committed to advanced nuclear power. It's committed to funding R&D for new forms of reactor technology and new fuel cycles over the next 10 years. I think that needs to continue, but I think it needs to be accelerated, and I think it needs to be directed towards uh, thorium-based nuclear technology and specifically liquid fuel thorium reactors. Uh, Stephen Chu's addressed molten salt reactors, I guess liquid fueled reactors, and saying that uh, liquid fueled reaction reactors are a proliferation concern. Um, do you do you see, think of that as an accurate statement, or where do you think he's coming from? So one of the main objections to uh, thorium-based nuclear power, and specifically liquid fuel thorium reactors, is that they somehow enhance the proliferation risk. That is simply not true. It is much more difficult to take either the waste or the fission products from, <coughs> excuse me, to take either the waste or the fission products from a liquid fuel thorium reactor and create bombs with it. For one thing, the people working on it would be dead within days, and it's simply unrealistic. And I think the people that make those objections, they're a, they're either connected to the existing nuclear power establishment, or B, they're simply anti-nuclear in the first place. And as a society, we're not very good at calculating risk. And if you compare the risks to continuing on the road we're on, to continuing uh, with conventional nuclear power on the one hand, to developing an innovative new strategy around thorium on the other, the risks are simply beyond compare. And we would lower our risk from Car emitting carbon into the atmosphere from proliferation and from nuclear waste by a huge amount by shifting to thorium. Okay, uh, do you have anything that you want to throw out there that... Uh, I think that's good. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Oh, uh, Sorry about the technical stuff. You're the, you're the first person I put in front of the screen. <laughs> Happy to do it.